एंड वेलकम यूर वॉचिंग बीट डायबिटीज मैनेजिंग प्री डायबिटीज नाउ डायबिटीज अवेयरनेस एंड प्रिवेंशन इज ऑलवेज अ टॉपिक ऑफ डिस्कशन अमंगस्ट आस बट वॉट अबाउट प्री डायबिटीज वर्ल्ड अ गुड अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ प्री डायबिटीज इज इसेंशियल फॉर आर ओवरऑल हेल्थ एज प्री डायबिटीज केसेज कंटिन्यू टू राइज इन इंडिया एंड अराउंड द वर्ल्ड प्रमोटिंग प्री डायबिटीज अवेयरनेस इज इसेंशियल प्री डायबिटीज डजेंट नेसेसरिली हैव एनी क्लियर सिम्टम्स सो इट ऑफन गोज अन नोटिस्ड एंड अन डायग्नोज some people may not realize that they or someone they care about could have pre diabetes however early diagnosis and treatment can help prevent or delay serious health complications therefore raising awareness of pre diabetes and stressing the importance of people knowing their risk is critical particularly now as the covid-19 pandemic has amplified the negative health risks associated with the chronic health conditions Now getting detected with pre-diabetes provides one with a window to take corrective steps to reverse the condition. You should consult a doctor and follow doctor's recommendation to make the necessary lifestyle changes. Today we have with us eminent endocrinologist who will help you understand and manage pre-diabetes. Joining us Dr. Sushil Jindal, professor and head of endocrine department People's College of Medicine Set Sciences and Research Center Bhopal. We have Dr. Sujoy Ghosh, um, professor Department of Endocrinology IPGME NR and SSKM Hospital Kolkata. Thank you doctors very much um, for being with us Dr. Ghosh. If I can begin uh, by asking you, you know, what is pre-diabetes and how long can this condition last in a person? uh more importantly when and how soon can pre diabetes progress to a full blown type 2 diabetes thank you very much firstly for having me on the show you know when we talk about blood glucose levels it's it's a spectrum disorder so at one end you will have individuals who have normal blood glucose levels and at the other end you will have people who have diabetes there will be a significant group of people who will not follow or fall in either of these two groups they will be in that middle group and by definition you know we say that you have diabetes if your post glucose readings are more than 200 and if your fasting blood glucose is more than 126 or your hba1c is more than 6.5 on the contrary if the fasting sugar is above 100 according to the ada or 110 but less than 126 according to the who you have what is called fasting hyperglycemia similarly if your blood glucose is between 140 to 200 after a meal you are diagnosed as pre diabetes so it's that borderline zone between normalcy and diabetes that we define pre diabetes remember this is pretty arbitrary it's not necessarily that you know you are 126 it means diabetes and 125 means that you don't have diabetes you have to look at it as a spectrum disorder that is, these individuals who are in this so called category of pre diabetes are at greatest likelihood of progressing to diabetes like you already stated now if you look at india probably 20% of the adult population is in this pre diabetes group so the dangers of that is progression to over to diabetes and certain problems like heart problems might start even at this stage of pre diabetes now the progression to diabetes is something which is not necessarily very fixed for example if you got a bad family history diet exercise is bad you've been treated with steroids you got pregnant then the progression to pre diabetes to diabetes is going to be much quicker it is estimated anywhere around 20 to 25% of the population will progress to pre from pre diabetes to diabetes in 2 to 5 years time but this is not necessarily applicable to all individuals and therefore the opportunities that we have here is that if you lose weight improve your lifestyle improve your diet and exercise you can probably prevent progression to from pre diabetes to diabetes and like you've already stated it might be asymptomatic at this point of time so there are two ways of looking at it a positive way that you have an opportunity to prevent progression to diabetes and the pessimistic view is that you probably already have risk factors which have started working to increase the risk of complications right i think that's a very crucial point that you're making there uh, dr jindal uh there is a rise in pre diabetes cases among younger people uh in fact and it is being detected in people who are even in their 20s 
What could be the reason for getting pre, pre, pre diabetes at such a young age? It's very true. Uh, actually, we keep seeing patients uh, where in, we keep seeing families where the grandfather developed diabetes at the age of 60, the father developed at the age of 40, and now son developed at 20. So uh, actually, uh, they are, they definitely there is a change in lifestyle which is producing it. We know that uh, genetically we are very prone to develop high glucose and subsequently pre-diabetes and diabetes. This is all because uh, that our metabolism in, evolved uh, like this, uh, that uh, whenever there is excess of calories available, we try to conserve it in the form of fat around the uh, abdomen. And this fat can be very quickly converted into uh, glucose. And this was a very big survival advantage at the time when there was a uh, food scarcity, famines. But now this has become a curse. So we see that uh, children are overeating and uh, there are no abundance of uh, food available and the type of food they consume also is a uh, very refined carbohydrates, very high in fat. So it's leading to obesity, which leads to insulin resistance and brings uh, dysglycemia or deranged glucose levels. And then over and above it, there is also lack of exercise. And uh, we see children, they are more focused on studies and whatever leisure time they have, they spend it on computers and mobiles and uh, TV rather than going to play grounds. And this leads again that uh, these uh, calories are not being uh, consumed or not be used. And so they become more and more obese. And lastly, there's also a factor of mental stress. There is, this is a competitive world. And uh, so uh, children are very, very uh, uh, stressed because of uh, these competitive examinations. And this brings in a lot of uh, hormones, which actually uh, produce uh, insulin not to work properly and then this leads to again high glucose levels and so this is all the, so we can say genetics is involved overeating is involved lack of exercise and also mental stress this is producing the uh, development of high glucose pre-diabetes at much younger age and most of our children they become at risk of developing pre-diabetes Right. Uh, so that, of course, is is an explanation of why young people are getting affected as well. But Dr. Ghosh, most people get diagnosed with pre-diabetes during a routine checkup. Could you tell our viewers if there are any signs or symptoms of pre-diabetes pre, pre that people should be aware of, that people shouldn't ignore? Uh, you know, this may perhaps go a long way in helping in the early detection of pre-diabetes. Right. First of all, I think you raised a very important issue. You've stated that people with pre-diabetes often get diagnosed only when they do a routine checkup. So first of all, a routine checkup is important for everyone. So once you're above the age of 25, Government of India guidelines says 30, but I would probably go down to age 25. We should have a blood test done at least once in every five years. And more frequently, if you have certain risk indicators like family history, obesity, polycystic ovarian disease, intercurrent infection, pregnancy, diabetes, and stuff like that. That's number one. Number two, the reason that you, the point that you make is that it gets diagnosed during routine checkup tells you that most of individuals with prediabetes will not have symptoms. So that's also important. So even if you don't have any symptoms, do a routine test. Now there could be certain indicators which probably tells the doctor or the patient that the possibility of pre-diabetes in such an individual is greater than the general population. For example, it could be if you're overweight, if you see that there's a darkening of the skin and the thickening of the skin around the nape of the neck, the armpits and the groins, what we call acanthosis nigricans, as if you've not washed yourself very well, not a very pleasant sight to look at, however mild it might be, that could be one of the things you might notice small skin tags around the neck and elsewhere in the body. These are all features that the hormone insulin is not working very well in your body. So these could be subtle indicators that there is insulin resistance and that you're more likely to have diabetes. Remember, if you've had some other tests as well, for example, you've had a, a blood pressure check and found that the blood pressure is high, your liver function test shows that you probably have liver enzymes raised, possible underlying fatty liver. You've got high 
lipid profile or bad lipid profile, all of those could actually be indicators to tell you, you know, there's something wrong and that you probably should have a test. And of course, like I said, family history, polycystic ovarian disease, irregular periods, hirsutism, all of those would be indicators that insulin is not working very well. And once you do the test, you might find that this is prediabetes or it could be very well overt diabetes. All right, we are going to slip into a very short break. Our panel of expert doctors will be live with us on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Uh, we're having an important conversation around pre-diabetes. Dr. Jindal, if I can come to you at the moment, uh, what is the role of the glycemic index of food in the management of pre-diabetes? See, glycemic index is an index which shows us that after consuming a particular food, how fast and how far the glucose level in blood will rise. And so if you are consuming food which is already pre-processed and cooked and which contains a lot of refined carbohydrates like sugar, then what will happen is that glucose level will go up very fast. But if we consume food which takes some time to get digested and assimilated, then we'll have a blunted type of response of glucose to the given food. See, when we were living in jungles during the ancient time, we were making a lot of effort to fetch food and then also we were using whole 20 feet, uh, 22 feet uh, intestine for digestion and assimilation of food. So blood glucose will not rise so fast after consuming food. But what has happened is that now we see that uh, we cook the food, we process the food and then we also use a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, refined carbohydrates in form of maida, in form of rice, sugars. So what happens is that this uh, uh, produces a very steep increase in uh, glucose level immediately after the uh, food. And this goes and then stimulates the insulin producing cells, which we call them beta cells. And they have to work very, very hard. And over the time, what happens is this, uh, these beta cells get exhausted and and then they may also undergo process of death so this is how the insulin becomes less and less and then the glucose levels they go up and up so it, the message is that if we consume a lot of uh, food which is low in glycemic index we probably will be able to avoid uh, high glucose levels in diabetics as well as in people who are in the normal range but they are prone to develop diabetes because of their genetics then we can definitely delay development of pre-diabetes and also diabetes. Now, food which uh, are recommended with high, uh, uh, low GI index uh, are uh, various uh, salads, fruits, uh, which take a lot of time to get digested. I'm, I'm not talking about the sweet foods, but I'm talking of uh, many uh, fruits which uh, are uh, available. And similarly, salads also, they have uh, carbohydrates which are, are not being able to be digested by human body. And so if you take a lot of fiber, a lot of uh, green vegetables in your diet, and then also some legumes and dals, they also have a lot of fiber. So we can prevent development of uh, pre-diabetes and diabetes if we make a habit of taking these food hmm. more and less of the refined carbohydrates. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ghosh? Uh, does losing weight help to reverse pre-diabetes and how much exercise per day is indeed needed if you want to lose weight and better manage a pre-diabetes condition? Right, I think I think it's become very popular now. You will find advertisements and a lot of uh, emphasis by lay press as well on reversal of diabetes and prevention of progression of pre-diabetes to diabetes. Essentially, one of the major causes of insulin resistance and the fact that the insulin doesn't work well is when we put on weight. The more fat tissue we have in the body, the insulin works worse and increases your risk of progression from pre-diabetes to diabetes. Now, uh, an individual might be quite way away from the ideal body weight target. That should not put off the individual from losing weight. Remember, it would be helpful to lose at least 5% of body weight. Most guidelines talk about a 7% weight loss. 
a 10% weight loss will be great. So anything between 5 to 10% weight loss will help reverse significantly a lot of the metabolic problems of obesity. That will actually lead to less risk of prediabetes progressing to diabetes, maybe even reversal of to normal state, and also important body benefits, including blood pressure and cholesterol benefits. Now, to lose weight, it's not very easy. Essentially, it's, it's a matter of energy balance. So let us assume that to lose weight, you will have to cut down on your calorie intake. A little bit of that has to do with the glycemic index, but overall calorie reduction. And also importantly, an increased energy expenditure in the form of exercise. So first of all, decide upon what exercise you can actually do, whether you've got bad knees, in which case probably swimming would be a good exercise. Otherwise, brisk walking is something which can be done very easily. Ensure that you exercise at least five days a week and at least half an hour every day, if not 45 minutes. So at least about 150 minute intense exercise a week will help in that endeavor of reversing pre-diabetes to a normal state or at least preventing progression to diabetes. Right. Uh, Dr. Jinder, can people with pre-diabetes consume artificial sweeteners? And which uh, artificial sweeteners in this case are safe? Uh, Artificial sweeteners are the chemicals which give you a sweet taste without uh, adding any calories to your food. And we have uh, many of them available in the market. And uh, see, if you can save uh, one teaspoon of table sugar, uh, which is also known as sucrose, you can uh, actually avoid something like 15 to 20 calories uh, from your uh, daily consumption. So if we use uh, these agents, uh, this will uh, help patient reducing the amount of calories he is consuming. Uh, the, there are many sweeteners available. There's one aspartame, which can, be, which can be given in the form of tablets, which get dissolved in the beverages, or it is also available in the form of powders. Uh, but the only problem with aspartame is that when it is added to very hot uh, liquids, it turns bitter. And so, some uh, people will not like that taste. Uh, then second uh, one is sucralose, which is very commonly used nowadays. It uh, is almost uh, 500 times more uh, sweetness, uh, it has more sweetness than the table sugar. And it can be used again, it is uh, quite uh, safe to use it. And then third is uh, stevia. This is an alkaloid, which is uh, derived from uh, a plant and uh, this again is a very sweet thing and it's again uh, many many patients uh, call it herbal sweetener uh, so we can use it use these uh, type of chemicals uh, judiciously they are actually uh, considered safe for consumption in a normal person except in children and pregnant women where it should be avoided and uh, they can actually add in cutting short the calories if somebody is eating a lot of uh, sweet or is using a lot of uh, sugar in their tea, coffee or milk, they, they can be done. But uh, only problem is that now there are some studies telling us that uh, the brain perceives uh, the sense of satiety by increase in glucose. And if we do not allow glucose to rise, then uh, probably the person may end up eating more calories in other forms. So there are some studies telling us that uh, overuse of these uh, may, not, may be counterproductive rather than helping reduce weight. Uh, but I'll say that uh, if somebody is very fond of taking sweets uh, and cannot uh, take tea, coffee without any uh, sugar, then these are very good alternatives and some calories can be avoided daily by use of these sweeteners. All right, uh, Dr. Kosh, there are also several supplements and products that are available in the market which claim to reverse prediabetes. Should people trust such supplements? Right, the basic principle or the basic premise on the basis of which people claim that these work is these are used as food replacers or food supplements is that for example you want your tummy to be full so that you don't eat other stuff and so that you don't increase your calorie intake now there are two or three things that i would like to talk about these so-called supplements and replacers number one they're very expensive number two we do not have randomized control trials to show 
that they actually work. So unless and until you have definitive evidence in future to say that such food replacers and food supplements work, I would, as a doctor, not recommend taking supplements. Secondly, a lot of these supplements contain a lot of uh, stuff in it, including maybe natural so-called herbal stuff, which often interact with the metabolism of some of the drugs that we use in clinical practice. And therefore, it's best avoided to avoid drug interactions from happening. Supplements are useful only in individu individuals who are probably unable to eat, but that's a very different kind of ball game than the kind of population that we are talking about. So unless and until it's needed, let's not go that down that way. Only if the doctor thinks that there's some deficiency that you're suffering from for which you need supplements, avoid so-called over-the-counter supplements and avoid misuse of prescription of so-called supplements. All right, I'm afraid that's all the time we have on the show. Thank you very much, doctors, for joining us.